This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today I have Ian Scheib on the show. He's a photographer, but he is oh so much more. He uh, does a ton of stuff. He's one of those photographers that is living the life that a lot of us wish we could live while we're couch surfing, watching some of the projects that this guy did. Uh, one of them, you know, he's, a, he's, he's working with the Discovery Channel or has worked with the Discovery Channel on a project called The Last Unknown. This is his latest project with those guys. We're going to dive into that project a little bit and some other things that kind of surround how one of those project go, projects goes from the ideation phase all the way through to you seeing it on your Apple TV or whatever in your living room. Ian, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me back on. I think we're going to have a great time doing this today. <laughs> yeah, I know. We should have been recording our pre-interview chat because that was the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm smiling coming into it because I know we're going to have fun. <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. It, these interviews are always fun, but especially... When I'm talking to somebody I, I really enjoy talking to about a topic that I'm really yeah. fascinated with, and this is one of those topics, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan of documentary films and, uh, you know, the stereotypical lifelong learner and all that stuff. I will watch, you know, a universe documentary on black holes before I'll watch some reality TV nonsense on television. I'm you both. So yeah, I hear you on that. That's that's so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in your I'm in your target market. So let, let's start with you, you've been on Twitter before, but let's start with quick introductions. Sure. sure. Ian Shai, who are you and and what you know what are you doing to sort of contribute to the world of content creation? What who's what's your elevator well, pitch for yourself? Where to begin? Well the elevator pitch, I need to recraft it I feel like every few months because I think everything's been a, a big evolution for me the last, especially the last uh, few years. But, um, you know, I consider myself first and foremost a photographer. I mean, that's my passion. That is the creative base upon which all of the things I'm doing are are built upon. And so, uh, you know, I've done a lot of books. I've published um, six books. My sixth book just came out last October, Refuge, America's Wildest Places. I uh, was considered by the New York Times, one of the top books of 2020, which was a, a huge honor. First time getting into the Times uh, like that. Yeah, it was, it was really great. Um, but then, you know, I consider myself a storyteller, you know, also right alongside that. So photography is sort of my visual passion, but storytelling, educating, connecting people to places and things that they may not otherwise ever get that opportunity uh, to do is, is really what drives me. And so that's, that opened this entire world of filmmaking to me. Um, and, you know, as a photographer, you're working, and especially the type of work I've done, it wasn't just landscape photos for calendars. It was journalistic. It was working with people, working with scientists, going into different places to, to highlight some aspect of either their work or what, something that was happening in the ecosystem. And so being this storyteller and this creative person who's always been a passion about film, I've been in the film industry too prior to my full-time career as a photographer, um, that's when I really started to look at, okay, maybe I have a role as a filmmaker. So the, the the elevator pitch, if I were to summarize all that is I'm a photographer, but at the end of the day, I really consider myself a filmmaker who's really, who's really created a new um, uh, specialty in producing really hard to do shows, really hard yeah. to produce documentaries in places that are equally as hard to get to and be there. Yeah. And I want to talk about that as much as we can. I want to, I want to kind of dive into the genesis of the last unknown and, yeah. you know, the, the path to get to the final cut. Right. Yeah. But before yeah. you, you mentioned, so I introduced you as photographer, you mentioned a filmmaker. A lot of people struggle with that, especially these days. Yeah. Cause those, those lines are blurred, right? That's why I kind of threw around the word content creator, but that doesn't feel yeah. right. It just feels like, that feels like, you know, generic, but how do you, you calling Ian Shive a photographer sounds like I'm putting you in a box that's way too small, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, so so how would you like? How do you how do you talk about it? Yeah, it's a weird thing, and you know, I'm hosting this show now too, so I'm yeah, I'm, which is <laughs> that was probably the most intimidating part of this whole process um, when Discovery. So you know, I produced a Shark Week for them about five years ago. It was one of the most uh, popular, most watched Shark Weeks. They still re-air it. It's the Sharks of Cuba. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really do anything for a bit. And then we started talking about doing nature again. And I got in the room and I gave this passionate pitch about here's the people I work with and everything. And it turns out, you know, the president's in the room and, and is apparently afterwards said something to the effect of, okay, let's make his show, but he really should be on camera. 
And that was a huge leap because I'd only ever really been behind the lens, behind the camera all of this time. And so, um, you know, I, I wasn't sure how that would impact the creative process. I was really concerned that I'd be more worried about what I'm saying, how, you know, what do I look like? You know, what am I doing? Um, how do I direct myself? Because I always thought that that is probably one of the hardest challenges in the film industry is how do you direct yourself? How do you judge a performance you're giving, not watching? And, um, you know, and in, 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 in general in the film. And, you know, I in the end, I actually didn't find it that difficult at all. Um, it, it, you know, the thing is, it's like I'm probably when I go into a place, we're doing the research, I'm producing the show, I'm coming up with the ideas. Um, you know, and knowing where I want to go, I'm talking to scientists, I'm the best person to talk about it um, in many ways because I'm the one who's in the trenches, everything leading up to the moment that that thing comes together to now being here in the field. And so I found this balance of being on camera a little bit, but then when I'm not on camera, I'm behind the cinema camera, you know, driving that or shooting stills. And, and I just got to a point, but it took a long time to do, I got to a point where I found a balance. And I felt like I was able to know the difference between when I should be on camera or, um, and obviously I've got a team, you know, they're filming and they're helping as well. I mean, they're very talented people who couldn't do it without them. But um, I found that balance of knowing, you know, how to do it, watching dailies. And you kind of get like, a, I've had a bit of an out of body experience, I think in a way, because it's now I watch the shows and the rough cuts. And before COVID, you know, we'd have an office with, you know, eight uh, screens and four editors and every screen would be my face on there. And I'd be like, Oh, you know, what? I don't like the way he looks there. Let's try this shot. It's like, I'm talking about myself, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Um, but you know, it's, it's the, the filmmaking side, you know, getting to that point and how to, how to, how, what do you, what do you call yourself? I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I think yeah. what anybody calls themselves. I think you have to just say, you know, what do I contribute? You know, what is it that I'm, I'm adding to this? So um, that's why I include, you know, the word conservationist in my in my byline. Um, it is maybe maybe that's the best because it, it represents what I hope my work impacts, whether that's a photo or a book or an article or a documentary. Yeah, well, well, let's let's explore that a little bit uh, in the context of this latest project, The Last Unknown. Like, yeah. how the, take us through that. Just you know, kind of the Cliff Notes version sure. of of the the inception of that project you know, from, okay, I have this idea and this is how much it's going to cost to get this idea. Then yeah. the, how the heck did you get the discovery channel? Obviously, you know, you've had experiences with them and ties with them sure. before. So it wasn't, it wasn't just like a, a cold call, but, but all the way through to like, it's released and you're sitting with your, with your family on the couch and you're like, okay, it's premiere, premiere night. Let's yeah. play this and enjoy it. What does that look like for the people that want to maybe walk in those footsteps and, and yeah. give it a shot? How do, how do they get started with something like that? Well, you know, in many ways, it is a little bit of a cold call. It is a bit of a knocking on the door. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, the entertainment industry is notorious for turnover and new people changes. So a lot of the people, in fact, I think almost all of the people that we did, except for one, our first show with, were no longer there. Um, and they had, mm. you know, enough time had passed that, the priorities had changed, initiatives had changed, direction had changed. And so in many ways, it, it was a cold pitch. Um, and it wasn't, you know, I love the title, by the way, like the last and known is just conjures this imagination and magic. And that that's kind of where I began. I began with the idea of let's go someplace no one's ever really gone before. And, and are those places, do they really exist on Earth? So it started with a very simple concept. Um, and then the next big piece that really brought it together. And, and you know, one of the things I try to tell people when they're thinking, well, how do I do that too? Is um, you, you really want to have, you want to have something to bring to the table. It, it, you know, an idea is one thing, um, but you want to have something more than that. Either you want to have maybe some a proof of concept, a pitch reel, um, something along those lines. And in my case, I had already taken a shorter journey into this area with the team as part of my work as a photographer and filmmaker with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So I had a relationship with the government entity. I had seen firsthand what I thought the opportunity was. And I was able to walk in and say, not only is this a great idea in my mind, but I have this really incredible relationship and story that I believe we can draw on. Um, and so I came with access. You know, I came with access saying, this is a place that we can access that no one else can access. If you don't work through, you know, these channels and, you know, anybody can, can apply, but you have to, you know, I have a, a history of working in endangered with endangered species and places like that where I'm going to be mindful and respectful. And, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, it's all the
Uh oh, we lost audio. Can you hear me? There you go. Yep, I got you now. Okay. Um, so you know, it's everything that leads up to it. You know, it's it's why I always say the greatest tool in becoming successful is perseverance. Just wait around long enough, build relationships. And then you have a network that you can rely on. So, so for me, it was a pitch meeting. Um, it took months, months, almost six, seven months before I even had a yes, let's do it. And then when we had a yes, let's make something, it was, well, what is that something exactly? Um, you know, and we didn't have anything. We didn't have a title. We didn't have graphics. We didn't have a format. Are we doing an intro? And then a, a title? And then a location map? And then do we go into the body of it? How many acts is the thing? Is it five acts? Is it six acts? I mean, there's a lot that goes into the process on it. And so, um, you know, really it's so much of it goes into the planning of of figuring out what you think it's going to be. And then you go out and in documentary filmmaking, which this is, this is genuinely led by the science, you know, and and by the people and and by the weather, um, you know, dictating what we're going to do. And so, uh, you go and you just look at it as I'm going to gather as much information and, and as much, you know, assets, creative assets, photos, video as I possibly can. And then you spend a lot of time in the edit bay um, and working it. And it's a very collaborative process. You know, we had an incredible producer at the network side who's just absolutely brilliant. Um, and, uh, you know, she's able to look at it from an outside perspective because uh, you're so close to it that, you know, it's you, you need that. You need somebody who you trust who can help guide and say, this really needs to be moved to the beginning. This should go to the end. Um, Mm -hmm. This isn't working. This is, um, you know, and a lot of people get frustrated, I think, with that experience from what I've heard at other networks and other places. Um, We did not have a bad experience. In fact, it was the opposite. I think it really increased the value of it. And um, and, and, and in a way, it's sort of like you have to be open to making changes and not being married to it. You know, I think a lot of people create something, and whether that's a still image or a video, and they say, well, I don't want to change it. This is what I think it should be. And, and, and it's very easy to do, and I'm guilty of it as well. Um, but, you know, our editors who are used to making changes all the time in the edit bay always say, that's what this is about. We're supposed to edit. We're supposed to revise. We're supposed to try new things until we get it to that point where, you know, we really feel like it's good. So, um, but, you know, all of those things ultimately, you know, build up to it, but it, it's a, it's a busy job. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm some executive producer of the show, so I'm not just the host and cinematographer, but I'm executive producer. So I'm interacting with the network. I'm looking at the marketing campaign. Um, you know, we're looking at partnerships and, and, and how can we promote it and, you know, filming those little things and doing things like what we're doing now to talk about it. Um, you know, all of it and making sure the materials are on point and that they're branded properly and they're not saying something, you know, that's inaccurate and, and being scientifically accurate, uh, you know, and, and, and there's just a lot that goes into it. So by the time it's on the TV, you pretty much don't want to do anything again. Uh, you're <laughs> You're like, I'm done with that. I don't, don't mention that title to me ever again. And I will never watch this thing. I can't. If it comes up it. in my next bit's queue, I'm going to do a thumbs down on it. That's, 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 yeah, that's exactly. Yes, exactly. You're at the point where you're like, please get me the hell away from this thing. But no, it's, you're, you're, it's almost anticlimactic because you get it, you see it, your friends and family, everyone's excited and it's amazing. And you're just like, we made it, you know, like, and I have like a ton of anxiety when I have, you know, we had 40 hours of footage for this 42 minute show. And, um, you know, we, it, you have an immense amount of anxiety having that on a hard drive prior to delivery, you know, cause you're oh like, God. Yeah. you know, you're talking about a six week, ep- ex- a six week expedition to a remote part of Alaska. And it lives on, you know, this, this, you know, very sophisticated state of the art, you know, backup system. But, you know, God forbid anything can happen. And it's like when you that day you finally deliver, you're like, now we're really done. You know, now we're really done. So yeah, it's like balance, balance. balancing an balancing an egg on a stick and trying to make it to the finish line. With the egg That's exactly the right. yeah. You know, I'm curious. I'm, I'm really good. There's so much stuff as you were talking like visually uh, I'm like imagining this this giant flow chart that's just you know, just growing with all these different tangents on it. Yeah. What, as a, as a, you know, as a photographer, you know, or sure. wh- however we decide to box you up, you know, but looking at it through the photographer, the vector, right. You obviously like creating stories and you're a conservationist. So you like creating stories that involve 
conservation and helping the planet and all that. Given that flowchart, what do you think was a the most satisfying part of this adventure for you? Was it the photography? Was it the hosting? Was it the post production? Mm. And mm. what was what was the thing that you learned the most from? You know, and kind of took away as a human that okay, I'm I'm different now because of this. Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, I think the thing I'm most proud of from overall uh, for the project, the last unknown, is is the ability to connect people to places that they'll maybe never see. Um, and, and, and you can't value a place unless you know what's there. You can't say it's worth protecting unless you know why it's worth protecting. And so, you know, that, that's the bridge that I feel my work builds. Um, so that's, that's, I think my, I, I, I like to say that, um, photography and film, especially are a form of visitation. It's a form of way for people to visit this place. Um, and, yeah, and, and accessible. It's accessible to anybody too, right? And um, you don't have to go 13 miles of a 50 pound pack to, to have the same sort of experience. There's nothing like being there, of course, but it's, it's certainly an important way to do it. I think what I took away the most, that's a really great question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this show is like my real first sort of big, long hosting experience. So, you know, I'm really proud of being able to, to get into that position and into those shoes and do it. I think there's a lot I would do differently. Um, if we were to do this over again, I think I've grown a lot, um, whether that be narrating or talking to the camera or, you know, I call it the camera confessional where I've got my phone and I'm like, Hey, I'm tired today. And God, it's, you know, it's that kind of stuff works really well when you bring it in. And we didn't do enough of that in my opinion. Uh, Um, but you know, it's still, it's still, you know, it's obviously a great adventure, but I, I think the thing I'm most proud of. I think it's the story. I think the storytelling, I think it's the, um, it's the way we took people. It's so rich, you know, with six acts to it and being able to cover all these things. So it's not posting. I don't think they're the best still images I've necessarily ever taken in my life. I think it's the package. I think it's all of it tied into one. Um, and you know, this is one of the first big true multi-platform efforts ever for any network. I mean, there's been some out there, of course, but this one is like true multi-platform in that we have short films on the web. We have virtual field trips on social media. We've got still photos, photo galleries, behind the scenes videos. We have a five minute film. We have a 10 minute film and we have one hour film all around this. Um, and, and so it's, it's a true multi-platform, uh, uh, initiative. And so I'm really proud because I think that's really the future of the model is being able to not just say, here's a one hour doc, but here's a one hour doc and 45 things around it so that people can interact wherever they are, whether it's on their phone or on their on a website or, you know, or what it is that they're most interested in, whether that's the photos, the shorts, whatever. Um, so I think the packaging of it, which is almost a business answer, um, you know, is the thing I'm most, most proud of. I think as a creative, uh, I'm really proud of the cinematography in the, in the mm. show. I think that yeah. it's just visually rich and beautiful. Um, we brought these incredible state-of-the-art camera systems out there, you know, shooting six and eight K with the, you know, the red dragon and heliums and, um, you know, prime Zeiss lenses and, and killer telephotos to get people close. And, cool. and, you know, we, we got beat up to get those shots. I mean, it was, it was tough work. So I think creatively that's the big takeaway. I love that. I love that, man. I feel like I want to be there. What was the, so you talk about gear and bringing the, the red gear out there. I've yet to even touch a red camera. So, you know. All right. <laughs> you know? We're going to hang out and I'm going to let you just, you know, hold it for a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't, I just want to just like, you know, uh, it's like a holy grail of image making. Yeah. Uh, what about drones? Were you guys, what, what did that look like out there? Were you, were you filming anything with drones? Yeah, we were able to use them there. Um, almost always, we were taking off from the boat. Uh, you know, we we didn't we never lost a drone. We, we've lost some our share of propellers and things landing on a moving boat in the Bering Sea can be kind of challenging at times. Um, wow. But yeah, and it's and so you got a moving. You're rocking around. It's moving forward. The wind is out there, gusting at different. You know, so it, it's pretty tough. But we use um we use an Inspire two uh on this project uh with the uh shooting in like 5.2k raw and uh and then processing those cdng files so our, so the drone work is you know it's really beautiful we had a couple smaller drones we had a mavic 2 it was, it was pretty fresh at the time that we were that we put into the inside of a volcano 
Um, and I was like, well, if we lose it, you know, it's, that's okay. You know, I didn't want to lose the Inspire too, <laughs> but I was like, we lose the Mavic. I'm willing to sacrifice it to the volcano gods. Um, but we ended up not, and we ended up getting these incredible shots, um, of areas that we couldn't walk to, uh, that were like bubbling up and steaming and venting and things like that. So we're able to take people, you know, physically inside the volcano. And the other thing with drones on this production that was really interesting is that, a lot of the places are completely inaccessible, even once you're there, because you've landed on the beach, but you might have shoulder high grass uh, and it's wet and there's no trails. And so for us to actually go and walk to a waterfall, um, there's this waterfall that's beautiful. We had a rainbow over it and everything. It's epically gorgeous. It's in the middle of this island. You know, the heat from the volcano is melting the snow and it comes down and there's this 200 foot waterfall. We could barely get to that thing. We couldn't get to that thing wow. on foot to film it. But a drone can go where we can't and show people the interior of places that have never seen a human footprint ever in history. And so it, it opens up a lot of opportunity and um, access to, to the islands. I love that, man. I love that. People have yeah. to watch this. I can't, I, I haven't seen it. I want to, I, I can't wait. When, when is this thing going to release? When is it going to yeah, drop? No, so it's, on, it's on, it's on Discovery Plus. We just launched and you can oh. start streaming it. Yeah. So it's, it's out and we're hearing awesome feedback from it and we've gotten great coverage and, you know, we've had some funny comparisons of my narration to, uh, to, you know, the, the, the God of all narration for nature, which is David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough. Yes. And, uh, and they said, I'm not him. So that was very nice. <laughs> it's fun <laughs> Attenborough. I'll tell you what, it's I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch your show before I watch, uh, the Jack Snyder cut of justice league. How about that? Yeah, so. I appreciate that. That's very <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> this one's before that. That was awesome. Congratulations, man. There's so Thank much you. to explore here. Cause yeah. you, you've had these amazing adventures out there. You've grown like this is, you literally, not that you, you, you know, you didn't know what you were doing before this, but from soup to nuts for this thing to go from, like I said, the ideation phase all the way through yeah. to the press play on, on TV, that sounds like multiple MBAs in various, <laughs> various verticals from, yeah. you know, how do you pitch a show to a network? How do you work with the network? How do you go out and shoot? What are the logistics around planning the shoot when there's zero margin for failure you can't yeah. say oh i forgot my batteries right so you know you can't go back and get the batteries i think i that take it for together granted. for you though yeah i think i take it for granted and, and i would liken it to the you know the analogy of a frog in, a, in the pot right like mm -hmm. I've, I've been doing it so long and gradually it wasn't like i woke up one day and said i want to make a television show it was i like photography I like storytelling that became short films that were good, not great. And those, you know, and it was this desire to keep getting better at the craft to the mm -hmm. point where you're gathering that, that education, you're gathering that information in your head and, and hopefully getting better. And you know, I, I can't tell you how many mistakes that I've made along the way, countless mistakes. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like having a scorecard and you're hoping that the, the side that says I've gotten more right than wrong is, is, is higher. Um, you know, it's the best way to explain it and, and not being afraid of the failure and embracing it and, you know, being told no is, is like a common thing. I mean, you know, even yesterday, I mean, I remember talking, I was talking to somebody and, and, uh, you know, I've got a TV show and, you know, we've got uh, four 10 minute films also on Discovery Plus that are part of the last unknown franchise. And, you know, I've got a streaming thing and I've had like a really good year and <laughs> this year and going, going out of, of last as a business person. And, and I still, I talked to somebody and they're, they're like, well, yeah, well, you know, it's, I, I was looking for more guidance and maybe a little more help on the business side. And they just didn't seem like, you know, this was even enough. And I, and I think it's because, um, you know, no one knows you better than you and no one knows what you are capable of. And that can't be taken away from you. The word no, or not interested, or I don't see it, or I don't think it can get there. Or, I don't think you'll get there. Those are all things that I've heard countless times again. And, you know, one of the, the things I think that's really um, led to the success that I've had with all of these things is that uh, with all these projects is that I kind of feel like I'm on a, I'm a train and you're either on it or you're not. And that's how I approach it. And it's like either you're on board and you get what I'm trying to do here or you're going to just stay where you are at the station. And, and that's kind of how I've looked at it a lot of times. And it's kind of a harsh thing to say maybe to some degree because it's like, you know, get on board or not, but after, you know, 15 years of this and, 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 and you know, really refining the craft, investing in the people and team around me, you know, it's not just me, 
I've had this, almost the same crew since the beginning, um, you know, doing this and they deserve almost more credit than me because they're the ones that are doing a lot of the, the day to day, you know, dirty work on some of this stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's the reality of it. I mean, it's like, yeah, we will do more and we will do really great things, you know, as long as I'm here to do it because it's what drives me. Um, but not everybody gets on board with that. And that can be really tough and really challenging and it can be disappointing and you scratch your head and, you know, even with all of these things and, you know, having a new show just released on discovery, I wonder like, you know, am I doing it exactly right? You know, am I, should I be doing something different? Is there room for me to change and improve on it? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's just a, maybe it's that, that dro- maybe it's that, that makes it successful is that, that, you know, that, that mentality, I'm not sure. And I think that that's the, that's, that's, I, I, you know, I'm no sage, but I look at that as the spark, right? It's just like, you know, the, the spark of even down to the smallest things like your office layout. Okay. How can I make this a little better next time? I, you know, 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 should I move that chair over there? Is the hat hat distracting? The hat should be, you know, or maybe I should use black brains instead of brown for these things, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 a constant questioning of yourself and iterating yeah. and having the courage to iterate to make things a little bit better. I, I've yeah. rearranged this office countless times. Right. It's almost yeah. a joke. You know, it's always moving and getting better. I think or, I feel, the last time I feel like you know, I it's, like, <laughs> it's different. It's different. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, you know, we, in the beginning we were talking about sort of the collaborative nature of all this and working with a good team and yeah. and being open to feedback and and you know you said what 40 some odd hours of footage to yeah. down to 45 minutes you know yeah. and, and being ruthless in the final cut how does that I'm, cu- I'm really curious how does that work when you are the person with the vision and whose name and face are going to be on this thing so you're the you know the literal and figurative fall guy for this, you know, for the project and the guy with the vision, yeah. how does that work with taking feedback, right? And someone or feedback that fundamentally goes against what you think is the right thing to do, but may be the right thing to do. Like that takes a, a person bigger than me. <laughs> you know, how do you manage that? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, you have to keep the idea that it is a collaborative process. And the second yeah. it's no longer a collaborative process for both and both sides need to know that, I think. In this in this area, um, then it starts to break down. So the mm-hmm. second you lose the collaboration, it it starts to immediately become a worse project. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of you know every now and then you see a director with a singular vision that executes it with no filter, and they do a great job. But a lot of times you see sometimes you'll see a director's cut, and it's not necessarily as good as the one that the studio executives and other people have been part of. Um, it just depends on the relationship and the, and the particular project and the vision. You know, not every yeah. and not every hit is a home run, right? You know, sometimes yeah. are better than others. Um, but when it, when something goes so against the grain of what you think is is right, um, which I, I actually was working on something recently. That, that that exact thing happened, um, and I wasn't sure if it, if they were serious about it or not, um, which was an interesting thing to to sort of be in a position. I couldn't tell was was this creative direction or idea an actual idea that they wanted to execute, or was it more layered than that? Was it more like, you know, we don't actually want you to do this, but we want you to think about it and realize, you know, is what you're doing, um, is it really better and can it be changed or improved in some way um, that maybe sort of heads in this direction a little bit. It's hard to explain without getting into the specifics, but it's, it's it, and, and I was vehemently against the idea and I still am. Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit. Um, but rather than just saying no, or this isn't the right fit, or I don't like the idea, or you're dumb and stupid or whatever it is that you might have the urge to say, um, Instead, you, you, you are, I find it important to articulate, and the more articulate you are about it, the better, articulate why you think this doesn't work. Um, and the thing I think that's helped me really um, position myself to, to make those people that I may not agree with in different projects, and I have lots of different projects, this isn't um, necessarily just about these shows, um, is, is to not respond right away sometimes, you know, to think about it. And, and, yeah. and I find that my opinion does change a day later or two days later. And, and so, you know, I will, I think there's this um, feeling that people have to respond right away. And, you know, I want to be responsive and everything. And, and I will be on a whole, 
But for things that are difficult or I'm unsure of or don't necessarily agree, I might draft something, sit on it, wait a couple days, see how I feel, make sure I'm understanding the thing that I'm not agreeing with. Maybe I'm not fully understanding it. Um, just very thorough process to it. And I think that if you do that, you'll end up where you should be on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really good advice. Just and that that's life advice, right? You don't necessarily need yeah. to respond right away. Don't respond first thing in the morning, laying in the bed on your phone, and don't respond last thing at night after you've had a jack or something, right? I, I, that's that is the most tempting thing of all, right? You gotta, <laughs> you're like, you're you're like, good. You're what like, did this person just say? What? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I really feel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, boom. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen some career limiting moves that uh <laughs> that happen spur of the yeah. moment like that it's you can't, kind of draft you can't unsend yeah. yeah no you can't and you know if you are going to draft something and not send it do yourself the favor and delete the the email address in the reply before doing it so you don't accidentally send it right, right. I, I write a lot of difficult emails and i delete the, the all the people in it um when i'm replying uh, and then re-add them all later just so that I'm like extra cautious about it because I want that time to think about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, like give yourself some time for your future self to make the decision. Not exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I'll be smarter tomorrow. I, I believe that that's the truth. <laughs> always, always. Well, here's, yeah, I want to wrap up, but here's, here's a couple of uh, yeah. different ways to look at this. So again, back to that person that's like, okay, yeah, I, I want to be a conservationist. I want to I want to create these amazing, beautiful documentary films and put them out on a world class, you know, uh, discovery type entity. Yeah. How? What does that look like? Like from a from a uh, uh, funding standpoint, sure. and just that not not giving any specifics about about this particular program, yeah. but just high level. What what does the money look like to get to get going and the potential payoff at the end of the day? Is it worth it or is it a, a net zero kind of deal? Um, I, it depends, to be honest. I, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So, I mean, I, I think that the most common paths, I can share a little bit of insight into those. Um, no matter what, you're probably looking at a pretty serious investment, um, you know, and it, and it can be expensive. I mean, I built up gradually. I bought my cameras. I financed the first one. You know, I was able to have a little more success. I bought others. I, I was, I bought things used, I bought things new, but I, I, I ultimately our company and my team, we own all of our equipment, which is a huge thing. So if I can produce five shows out of it instead of one show and doing, spending it all on rentals, that makes a big difference on how much money you're actually working with in a production. But mm -hmm. productions, I would say, you know, of any scale in nature, you know, on the very low end, you're talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, you know, you see things like, you know, the big epics on, you know, BBC and that kind of stuff. And you're talking about 60, 70 to a hundred million dollars. Um, so, you know, you're talking, there's a very large, uh, you know, space and window in there on it, but the key is to figure out, and a, and a network will love you if you can do this, and this is something that we do, is how can I do something that looks like it's a lot more than it actually is? And so that's why we've made such a significant investment in state-of-the-art technology and lenses and quality and post-production materials and software and finishing software and audio cleanup and color correction, visual effects, and all of that kind of stuff that we do. Um, so I've built the company to a point where we're able to do really great productions at uh, what would be considered relatively affordable in the industry. Um, so it gives you a lot more access. The other thing is partnerships are very important to that. And so working with different groups who may may say, well, we'd love to be a part of it. You know, maybe we're willing to subsidize some costs or maybe we just give you access to, to people that you can interview or whatever. And those are ways to create, um, you know, increased value. But Ultimately, you know, the, the pathways are you can have an idea and you can execute it on your own, which we've done before, um, but those are very difficult to be successful because you're basically building something not for anyone in particular. You're building a film for really yourself. And so, you know, you may take it to a television network and they're like, well, this is all one thing without commercial breaks. Well, how do we get commercial breaks? You got to recut it. Or maybe it does have commercial breaks, but it's not the right number for that particular network. Um, you know, if you're doing theatrical, then maybe you can just do that. And here's two hours and I'll take it to festival. Maybe that's the way to go. But when it comes to television, doing these kinds of things, you're really thinking about, um, 
you know, the, the, who are you making it for? Who is their audience, which will also impact it. Um, but you can do it on your own, but then you've got to finance it on your own, shoot it, edit it and hope that you sell it. Um, or you can pitch it and then they'll do a commission and essentially they're paying you, giving you the money to go out and make the show. Um, but you've already created a budget and maybe shown that there's some value in that. But you know, the, the other thing is when you do one versus the other, the first way you own everything, but if they're paying for it, they own everything. So whoever's writing the check at the end of the day controls the content, but there's a lot of variation in there, you know? And so we owned a lot of our content prior to doing this. And so, um, this particular show, you know, it's not as cut and dry as some deals might be, but, um, but it's, it, it is an expensive endeavor. And, and as executive producers and owner of that, um, you own the idea and you own the responsibility. You know, if we overspend uh, and, and we have um, excess costs that uh, are our own fault, you know, we spent too much, hired too many people who were in the field too long, had to change a bunch of plane tickets, who knows what, it comes out of your pocket. Mm-hmm. You don't, it's not coming out of their pocket, it's coming into your pocket. And my fee is the last fee to be paid. And so you go into the field in a, in a situation like this, carrying a lot more than your equipment, you're carrying risk. And, um, and so you want to make sure you get it right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is so much to it. You know, I wonder, you know, in terms of that pitch, you know, the initial pitch that, you know, that may, let's take it from the, you said there, there's a couple of modalities there. There's, you know, you have a pitch that's fleshed out and you show the odd, you know, that there's a, yeah. a, a potential audience and then you show yeah. it and then you get funding and you go do the thing or you do yeah. it on spec and you shoot it and then you try to sell it. What, how far upstream does that pitch occur? Like, you know, to, to frame it better, does our, does someone with an idea, like someone has an idea to do, you know, a documentary exposing the homeless situation in San Francisco, California from a specific angle, right? So they want to shoot that. They're passionate about, you know, helping with that situation. Do they draft that pitch and then come to a production company and convince the production company to do it for spec? And then you go to a discovery or do you go to discovery? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So originally when I started a great question, uh, and again, there's a lot, there's no one way I find everybody gets their different. Mm-hmm. after talking but um yes going to a production company that has a track record that can basically be a seal of approval on a project is very very important um yeah. and you know i worked my first projects we were not the only production company we were a co-production with somebody who had a lot more experience knew how to run the budgets knew how to package and, and deliver a show to a network because there's a lot of like, very technical components to that Um, but working with a production company is a great place to start. It it, it does give you that seal of approval, um, that a network executive may, may require, um, and certainly would need, you're not going to just pick up the phone and and call, you know, NBC and say, I've got an idea. Um, you know, and that's where relationships really come into it. You know, you may get to that point where you have your own production company, uh, like we do now. And you can say, well, I've got these projects that we're developing on our own. Um, but we just had another project come in from a a nonprofit partner, uh, that was already shot, uh, didn't know exactly how to package it and came to us to package it. And we were able to bring it out, uh, to a network and successfully land it, uh, for them. And so, you know, that was a, that was a way to do it. Um, that doesn't happen with everything. And, uh, but the, the production quality that they had done was very, very good. Um, and we felt that it was something that was viable. Um, and so it really is a great place to sort of vet an idea and start. Um, you know, if you're a writer, that's different a little bit, you know, if you're only a writer, but if, you know, if you have a pitch reel, that's the, that's the next big thing I would say that's really important. My first show we sold because I produced a five minute piece about the place and it wasn't super high end or expensive. Sometimes there's still photos, narration, and, you know, or even just a drawing or a sketch, but we kind of were able to frame it out a little bit with some music and give it some style to say, this is what we're going for. Um, and I find that that's really helpful because you never know if the person you're talking to has an imagination or not. Um, so if you're just walking into a room saying, this is what I envision, they may be sitting there with absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Like this, this, this one's off his rocker. I have no idea what they're talking about. Whereas if you just sit down and say, here's, here's two and a half minutes of what we're thinking about. No imagination required. They see exactly what it looks like. Is this a fit or not? And it, and it just moves things along so much faster. 
Yeah. Do you think, you know, kind of that we're in the, as we record this, it's March 19th, 2021. Um, so we're kind of hopefully on the tail end of this whole pandemic thing, right? So the, you know, a, a bunch of questions I had on my list were about how did you manage things during all this, this insanity? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but, you know, maybe we can go into that a little bit before we break. But sure. the, the, the one piece of that is, were there like specific good things that came out of the pressure that the that the pandemic exerted on a on a production like this like we were able to do most of the meetings you know the production meetings through zoom or we started yeah. using film you know frame io for remote editing collaboration sure. instead of sitting in an edit bay together you know what 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 came out of it what learnings from that came out of it yeah yeah we definitely used all that um well you know we were very fortunate in that you know, I have a diverse business because I also have a, a photo library, an asset library of content. And we have, you know, we had the show, but we have about 500 hours of other high quality content that we've been shooting over the years on projects that we own. So when people couldn't go out and shoot for a very long period of time, we were able to say, well, we have a huge body of work that we can create new products from. And let's think of ingenious ways to go about that, which is what we did. Um, and, and are still doing actually in many ways. Uh, so that was very beneficial. Um, but yeah, we, we all adapted. I mean, you know, we, we broke, um, our company broke into home offices. Uh, you know, I was in the middle of producing the show and, uh, also dealing with moving out of our office, uh, here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and shifting my editors into home edit phase and figuring out, well, how do we get footage from here to here when before it was all on one row? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we share cuts and, and things like that? And so the cloud became uh, helpful. Um, you know, we have a lot of our own sort of proprietary technology that moves things around. Um, you know, Zoom meetings, as, as we are here right now, have become the norm. Um, yeah. But there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot liberating about that too, because, you know, you could, there, were, there was the danger zone of always working, you know, because now you were home. And, and so creating that separation of space, if, if that's an option, I think has been very helpful and I recommend for people. But, um, but you know, I think once that was done and sort of accepted the idea that this is the reality, all new processes emerged. And I think things started to, to improve quite a bit. But um, the impacts, uh, obviously, are tremendous. And you know, we had a film out, Hidden Pacific, uh, an IMAX movie, IMAX 3D movie that opened in LA on March 15th. Um, and LA closed on March 16th, everything. So you know, that, that was a huge hit to, to the company and to me. It was our first theatrical film that we also invested in. We covered the 2D production of. Um, and so it's coming back as screens reopen and we're seeing things happen. And we, we started to pivot and look at, are there streaming opportunities for that? Can we license it you know, around the world, international markets? And, and so it just became about pivoting. But all of it, I mean, the COVID is really, um, was, was an accelerator in many ways of, 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 I think for a lot of companies of problems that already existed were brought forward very quickly. I think it was an accelerator of new ideas and streamline. Like I think our company uh, is a lot more, cleaned up and streamlined now in a way that, you know, it was, it was easy when things are great, everybody's not paying attention, you know, you've got subscriptions to who knows what software and things like that. I'm like, well, maybe we should start to trim back a little bit and right. kind of take another look at, do we really need these things or not to be successful? And, uh, and what things do we need that we don't have, you know, and, and we should be making investments in. And so, um, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's obviously a great human tragedy, but I think from the business world, there have been a lot of really great things that have come out of it. And, and it's a time of introspection and reflection on priorities and, and saying, what do I want to do? And, you know, I have no desire to do everything. I want to do really great things. Yeah. Um, I'd rather do less of something and, and be very proud of it. Uh, the way we are of this show, because I'm very proud of the show. It's a, I think it's the best work I've done on film. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and I think that's also a lesson that we've all learned, including my team and, and staff at the company. I love it. I love it. There's so much. There's so much there. You know, the industry, like you mentioned, the film industry, and I'm I am just a consumer. I'm a, you know, a butt in seat number, you know, yeah. in the film industry or a subscription, as it were. Sure. Right. But it, it, the the industry, I'm guessing, has changed and is going to yes. it's it's going to evolve and we're gonna see that. Yeah. You know, from your standpoint, I know you don't have a crystal ball or anything, but from your standpoint, what is what does that look like? Are we seeing 
Are we going to see smaller theaters, more bespoke theaters? Are we all going to be watching from home now? Or do, are they going to give us masks at the theater with the, with the film <laughs> branding on it? Like what, what, One of the what things, I'm, I'm curious to know what happens to 3D. Yeah. Uh, because that means putting on glasses that maybe somebody yeah. else used or weren't cleaned. Um, I think that may have an impact. I think uh, it's hard to say. I mean, in my opinion, and that's all this is, uh, you know, I do think that there's going to be a, a, a very rapid demand for human experience. Um, and so I think the museums and the theaters are going to boom back to life. Um, yeah. I also think the casinos and a lot of other things and, 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 uh, nightclubs, I mean, life is going to come back um, with a vengeance. Yeah. With, with a vengeance. Um, and I think that'll be fantastic for business and fantastic for film. Um, but what does it look like? Uh, I think it's anyone's guess. I think it's going to be, you know, a lot about comfort level, for you know whether people want to wear masks, I think that'll probably take a long time before we really stop seeing them, if ever. Um, yeah. You know, and, and with all the new changes and who knows what's coming next, kind of thing, I think people are going to be really cautious about what they do. But I think the movie industry has been completely reshaped forever. I think it needed to be in many ways. Um, I think it did accelerate things like you know, is only releasing in a movie theater a great idea, or should we be doing a you know a day and date you know with with streaming services? And I know I'm one of those people who I like movies sometimes to go, but I also really like being in the comfort of my home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, yeah. and uh, so, it, you know, I think that that's an important thing for the business. I, I, I mean, I stopped going to a lot of movies just because, you know, you hear people, you know, rustling around and eating and doing their phone. And yeah. Their phone. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And so, you know, it's maybe maybe that would open more revenue if, if the model can be refined. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be certainly very interesting to see. But I'm, I'm I got I got to make a prediction. Can I make a prediction yes, right here yes, right now? Uh, my prediction is we're going to see a resurgence in drive-in theaters where, the, but not like your, not like your seventies and eighties drive-in theaters, yeah. a 20, uh, 2022 version of drive-ins that are kind of cool, you know, yeah. with Bluetooth and all that other stuff. So yeah. I, I want to see that. I think that'd yeah. be, that'd be really cool. I, I think so too. I think you'll see that. I think you can see that across the board, but yeah, I, I hope so. I, again, you know, with any great problem, because uh, we, we gain a lot of innovation and, and change. Um, you know, what, the, what people and humans are able to overcome and achieve almost always comes out of these, these absolute tragedies and, and difficult times. And so yep. I, I think we're poised to see a lot of really interesting things too. Ah, so good. What a good conversation, man. What, oh, man. Uh, what's next? What are you working on now? So that, the, <laughs> the last I know is in the can and out yeah. in the world. And yeah. people are consuming it, enjoying it. Uh, people should absolutely go check it out. Go watch it on Discovery Plus and uh, listen for this man's narration in there and see if, see if it matches his tone on this interview. Let's see. No, I'm no David Attenborough. That's what the, uh, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal said. And I was like, well, I appreciate the comparison, I think. But uh, <laughs> it was an excellent review of our, of our show. But thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm hoping to continue to build on The Last Unknown with, uh, with Discovery and continue to build on the franchise. Um, we're uh, entering our third year of Nature and Focus, our digital series on discovery.com. Uh, and uh, it's discovery.com slash nature and focus. We produce, I don't even know how many episodes on there now, 20 some episodes or so. Wow. Uh, wow. Short films in nature. One of my favorites is about Comet Neowise and coming through, but we've, we've done some cool stuff in, in Mojave Desert and places like that. Um, but we've got a lot of other new things coming forward. So, um, you know, my relationship with, with uh, we call it disco. My relationship with disco has been awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's funny when we were filming the little side story, we we're filming uh, the last unknown in Alaska. We all have radios wherever we are to say, Hey, we're done filming or, you know, we're, we're on our way or we're okay. We're alive, you know, whatever it was. And we'd, we'd be uh, disco team one. And it was always like disco. <laughs> we're like, disco. Nice. We're going to the disco. <laughs> and, and the crew loved that. It was always like one of the jokes. Anything's funny when you're out there. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like um, a deployment. <laughs> yeah, but we're working on more of that, and you know, we're looking at uh, you know where to go, and uh, you know, we haven't actually started filming any of those. We've been filming and working on nature and focus quite a bit, but we have some other stuff that's coming, I think, very soon uh, that we're finalizing on production for Discovery, um, and then uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, Hidden Pacific can get back out into the world too. So I'm working on some promotional things for that, but um, 
yeah, I think maybe back to Alaska and, and there might be some trips, you know, when it's safe again to uh, start bringing some other places from other countries into it. So we'll see. So, yeah, so watch this space for sure. Um, one question that I didn't get to, I want to just throw in here real quick yeah. um, before we before we end is Absolutely. a lot of people watching this, you know, that that are, are subscribers to this week in photo. They shoot mirrorless consumer mirrorless cameras. You know, some people are still shooting DSLRs, but for the most part, it's mirrorless cameras, phones. You yes. know, a lot of people are, are, are advanced amateurs. They've got amazing camera gear, lighting, the whole nine yeah. yards, computers, yeah. and, you know, editing software, all that. They're good to go from, a, from an advanced amateur standpoint. Looking at that, that sort of suite of s- stuff that advanced amateurs have, whether it be a cell phone all the way up through to, like, you know, a consumer mirrorless camera, can they create you know, this level, maybe not this level, you know, of content, but do they really, do they need a couple hundred thousand dollars in order to create something? Give, give, give some words of no. encouragement to the folks that heard that $200,000 number. Or like, you know, I'm hanging up my cape. I can't do that. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, in fact, you know, a lot of the most difficult and hard to do scenes are shot with our uh, iPhone and our GoPro at times. Um, you know, when, when we're in the rafts and we're getting wet or beat up or the cameras are in the cases because we're moving them out. I mean, you know, working with those high-end cameras gets you, you know, the, the, this incredible picture quality that's cinematic and we can do really high speed, which is for wildlife, you know, of a flock of birds flying through the frame really, really slow. You're going to want something good, but you can honestly, a great story is more important than the camera you use. Um, a story always overrides it. I mean, that's why I always joke, you know, the 15 year old on a webcam in the bedroom has 33 million views and 18 million subscribers because they're funny and they tell a good story, not because they have a great camera. Um, and you know, a lot of our digital series and show is, uh, is becoming more and more shot, uh, regularly with whatever it is we have, including, uh, including our phones, um, because they're faster, they're quicker. We can get it out um, easier. The quality is still incredible. Um, it's um, unbelievable how good the quality is on it. So, no, the gear isn't. The gear is really an extension of your ability to tell a story in multiple levels and layers. But it is not the bar of entry. Um, and the bar of entry is your ability to tell a story, and that can be done on anything. Um, but there is, you know, there are technical deliverables that people have to make for a big television network. Um, but that doesn't mean your pitch piece isn't done entirely on your phone. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. That is so cool. Yeah. Ian, thank you thank for you. coming on. Always a pleasure chatting with you. I feel yeah. like the next time we talk, you'll have, you know, you'll be doing a, a, a documentary about SpaceX and their first settlement on the moon. You know, <laughs> the last unknown is, you know, not here on Earth. So. You, you, you may be closer than you think. Ah, interesting. Maybe closer than you think. Yeah, I'm working on a project I can't really talk about, but I've spent the last, I'm a little burned right now, uh, but I have spent the last week out in the Mojave Desert looking at some stuff that is, let's just put it, uh, not of this world. <laughs> interesting. Uh, All right. Stay so tuned on that. <laughs> you are such, you're such a producer, right? Look at that cliffhanger right there. <laughs> leave it right there. Yeah, that's it. Right? Leave, 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 we'll leave it right there. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned yeah. for our, our next episode when our intrepid, you know, conservationist will be in parts unknown. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. You, uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you and have a great weekend and be safe down there. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's always a blast. So much fun talking to you. I, I can do it every week. It's a great time. I love it. I love it. Cool, man. All right. Enjoy and good luck with that next project. You know, I'm going to be pinging you on that. So <laughs> better. I hope so. <laughs> All right, man. You yeah. take care. You too. This is Twitter.